Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we're going to be analyzing an update to the Equifax data breach, and then I'll be answering a whole bunch of your questions. In reality, this is just a listener questions episode, so go ahead and stick around. Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to episode 178 of the BSP. My name is Bandrew. This is what I says. Like always, in the show notes, there are timestamps of everything that I talk about. If you want a different version of the show, either audio or video, BandrewSays.com. And if you want other podcasts, go check out GeeksRising.com. Let's talk about the only new story we are covering this week, which is an update around Equifax and the Equifax data breach of 2017. So let us back up two years to 2017. Equifax had a huge, huge data breach where around 150 million people's personal information was leaked or breached or stolen. This information included your name, social security number, addresses, birth dates, etc. Pretty much every piece of information that would be necessary to steal your identity. Equifax said, here, here's a bunch of information. Want to steal somebody's identity? Here you go. That's what they did. Following this breach, it really didn't appear that much happened to them other than a few executives ended up going to jail for insider trading. If you don't know what insider trading is, it essentially means that somebody sold stocks prior to the public availability of some information that's going to materially affect the stock price, whether it be a positive or a negative. If you have insider information, something that is not publicly available, and you know that's going to make the stock price jump up. So in theory, you can go and buy some stocks so you gain all the benefit and all the money from that stock price skyrocketing. But God forbid the SEC or the Securities and Exchange Commission finds out. Because if they find out that you made a trade with non-publicly available information, then guess what, buddy? You're going to jail. So only a couple of executives went to prison based on insider trading, not for negligence, not for not storing people's information properly or securely. But here is the update. It was just announced that Equifax agreed to pay at least $575 million and up to $700 million as part of a settlement. This is great news, right? $700 million for all of the consumers who got screwed by Equifax. Not necessarily. When you look at the breakdown of what this 575 or up to $700 million is, $300 million of this bucket is being set aside to fund their free credit monitoring services. $175 million is being paid to 48 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. $100 million is for CFPB and civil penalties and up to $125 million is going to be used to compensate consumers for their losses. So based on that, it looks like $125 million is being set aside. So if your data was stolen or if your data was compromised in this breach, you get a portion of that, right? A portion of $125 million. Wrong. Only $31 million of that $125 million is being set aside for compensation for the people whose data was included in the data breach. The rest of the bucket is to compensate people who are able to actually prove that somebody stole their identity because of the information in the data breach. Therefore, there's only $31 million for those of us whose data was stolen in the data breach. If 1 million people sign up or claim their checks, that means each of us will get $31. That's all it's worth. But it gets even better. If all 147 million people claim their checks, you get a whopping 21 cents. That is all that your information is worth. 21 cents. (laughs) Now, I screamed about this story so many times back in 2017 and 2018, but this is getting insane. No, this is beyond insane. This is a company that has all of our most sensitive identifying information short of freaking medical records. Thank God, because otherwise all of our medical records would be out there. 
Do you think that a hospital or an insurance agency that had such lax security measures on their data storage would get off this easily? Probably not. There would be people in prison. But no, identity theft, no big deal. Your social security number, no big deal. It is absolutely insane. The worst part about this to me is we are not even able to opt out of this service. It is just there. If you exist, if you have a credit card, if you buy a house, if you buy a car, you are in their system. There is no way to avoid getting into this system unless you live completely off the grid. That is the most criminal thing about this to me. They are a publicly traded company. Why are we forced to use their service? It doesn't make any sense to me. And because of that, the thing that becomes even more egregious is the fact that they did not do their jobs when it comes to securing all the data that we as consumers, as citizens, work so damn hard to keep secret. And guess what all of that is worth? Guess what that violation is worth? 21 cents. Less than a quarter. <laughs> or you know what? You're not completely out of luck they will offer you a free credit monitoring service. So you are actually being given the option to give the company that is showing that they are incompetent more of your information and more control over what goes on with your personal data. Seems like a great idea to me. I just want to include this one last thing because this pissed me right the F off. Let me read this to you. This comes from the FTC announcement. Despite its failure to implement basic security measures, Equifax's privacy policy at the time stated that it limited access to consumers' personal information and implemented reasonable physical, technical, and procedural safeguards to protect consumer data. Now, I'm not necessarily angry that the FTC included this quote in there. What bothers me is this illusion that we have an option here. The privacy policy implying that we may have an option to opt out. Like we have any say of what is done with our data. No, we're forced into this system. The privacy policy is useless to us because we can't say, I don't like that privacy policy. Can I just stop? Can I not use your service? Because the answer is no. You have to use their service if you want to function in today's society. For all we know, Equifax could come out tomorrow and change their privacy policy to say, we're going to take your data, bunch it up into a little ball, and shove it up each other's ass because that's how we get off. And we would have no say about it. We couldn't say, you know, I really don't want you doing that with my data. Can I have that back? Can I not give you access to that information? You're stuck with it. Privacy policy or not, you can't say, I don't like your privacy policy. Stop using it. We are completely and utterly f***ed here and nothing has been done except give some states a chunk of change, pay some civil penalties, and offer you a way to give Equifax more of your information and claim 21 cents, which is all you're f***ing worth because we are all worthless drones. F*** us, right? F*** us in our stupid, stupid ass. Now, with all of my hyperbolic screaming out of the way, what should you actually do with this information? Don't give Equifax any more of your information. Do not sign up for their free credit monitoring service because that is just giving them the right, that is just giving them authorization to track you more, gather more of your information, and monetize it however the hell they want. What you should do is call every single credit rating agency, pay whatever it costs, it probably shouldn't cost you more than $30, and freeze your credit. Freeze your credit score, freeze whatever the hell it is. What that means is when somebody decides to steal your identity with the information that Equifax so graciously put out there for these thieves to use, they won't be able to open a credit card, take out a loan, because your credit is actually frozen. And that means no new lines of credit, no loans, no nothing. That is the safest way to go about it. And do not try to get your $30 back. I think Equifax said, if you froze your credit, you can get money back by filling out this form. No, I'm not going to give you any more of my information. You absolute scumbag criminals. You are the worst company. You are forcing people into your system and you do nothing to actually secure their data. F*** you, Equifax. F*** you up your stupid ass. I want my data back. I want my information back. I want to opt out of your system. 
that's it. I'll link the FTC announcement in the show notes if you want to read some more and get angry. Oh, I, I take my data. Let's jump to what you had to say. That's literally all the news. First comment comes from Heather. You are already not being found. As the creator of something, there are lots and lots of things you can do to share and spread awareness of your creations. If you want to grow, relying solely on discoverability through search is not something I recommend unless you are fine with the limitations of only one method of discoverability. Have alternatives to your alternatives. It will help. Heather, thank you so much for that comment. Excellent, excellent advice. But first off, if everybody does not know, Heather is the host of the Sunshine and Power Cuts podcast. And in August, we got the Sunshine Summit. If you want to check that out, go to geeksrising.com. At the top, there is a huge banner about the Sunshine Summit, a week of amazing guests celebrating connections. Check it out. It's going to be a blast. So I do agree with you 100%. You should not rely solely on any one method for discovery because that one option or that one thing you're relying on can disappear overnight. Just like you need to diversify your income streams, you also need to diversify your discoverability. You need to focus on word of mouth. You may benefit from running some advertisements on Facebook or Instagram or Google AdWords or anything. You may benefit from submitting your stuff to other podcasts, or you may benefit from being a part of a community, mainly a valuable member of a community. Then people will say, well, what do you do? How do you know so much? Well, I run a podcast on that topic. Heather, excellent, excellent advice. Next comment comes from, I don't want to channel. I am just commenting. The first thing I do with a new app before it runs for the first time is go into a third party app and change the app's permission. Why does a flashlight app need to run at startup with full network access and access to my contacts and storage? Afterwards, if the app doesn't accept my changes, then I uninstall it. Very rarely am I the one at a loss. IDWC, which is what I am going to abbreviate your name to now. (laughs) I think that is a great comment and a great suggestion and probably a best practice that everybody should do when they download a new app. I'm going to start doing this. When I download a new app, I'm going to go into my settings and security settings and app settings and see what it's asking for access to. Why would it need access to my contacts? Block, camera, block, microphone, block. You don't need that flashlight. And then when you open it up and it says, we need to access this or you can't use our app. Well, all right, I won't use your app. Very good suggestion, IDWC. Next comment comes from Adrian Gaming. Love the podcasts, my man. I also love Observe and Report, really good dark comedy, and Seth Rogen really adds such a personality and life to it. He's such a wonderful actor. Adrian, thank you so much for the comment. I appreciate the kind words, and I just had to include this comment to say, Yo, Adrian! Yo, Adrian! It's been a while, man. I I should send you a DM, see how you're doing. I hope you've been well. Adrian does strategy gaming videos, which are excellent, and he has such a good voice, and he sounds great on the RE320, if I remember correctly. But yeah, after the, after I finish recording, I'm going to send Adrian a note, because it's been a couple of months, and I hope he's doing well. I hope you're still playing music, man. This is getting weird. This is a personal thing. <laughs> hey, Adrian. <laughs> Next comment comes from Fat Lowell's Radio. In regards to Child's Play, the Monster of the Week format could work, but not with a pre-established film series being rebooted like that. Back in the early 80s, they tried to do that with Halloween, and it failed because they spent two movies on Michael Myers and then made a completely unrelated story in Halloween 3, and the audiences weren't having it. If they were to make a series where a different aspect of childhood takes a horrific turn in each film, I think that could work. However, with the current mindset of mainstream Hollywood not wanting to break out of their comfort zone, and establish new IPs, as evidenced by the constant reboots and spinoffs of pre-existing properties, so much so that even the one-off horror movies like The Curse of La Llorona are in the Conjuring universe, it's highly unlikely they will be willing to go that route. Fat Lil's Radio, that is an excellent, excellent point. When a film series starts and they set this expectation, that's what people expect when they go to see the next film. Hence, expectation. When they divert from that expectation, it doesn't seem to work. The thing is, I'm not sure some of these films are intended to be a part of the universe they end up in, like The Curse of La Llorona. 
I don't think that was intended to be a part of the Conjuring universe until the studio got their hands on the script or maybe they saw the dailies and decided, you know what? If we add this one scene, we can tie it into the Conjuring universe and then maybe 10 extra people will go pay to see it in the theaters and 20 more people will buy the DVDs when we bundle them all together. It's an excuse to create a 20 DVD or 20 Blu-ray set, The Conjuring Universe, the entire story, when really you don't need to see The Curse of La Llorona because that has nothing to do with The Conjuring series. I agree with you 100%. On the note of The Curse of La Llorona, I highly recommend everybody watch Mr. Mr. Gigi's review of that. I will link it in the show notes. Mr. Gigi is a legend. Next comment comes from Stefan. He says, what about recording a podcast editing via OBS and upload this, including narration of what and why you are doing this? Stefan, that is an excellent, excellent suggestion. And you just may be seeing one of those come out very, very soon because I liked the idea so much that I am going to probably be doing that and showing that and recording that and uploading it for this episode. We will see. I have been making comments to the camera when I screw up and say why I stopped, why I'm doing it again, all of that stuff. So you may see that very, very shortly. Stefan, great, great suggestion. Next comment comes from Jeff and he says, Hi, Bandrew. I've got a problem here. I watched your and other comparisons about a thousand times, yet I cannot decide whether I should get the RE20 or the SM7B for my home studio. I would use it mainly for singing, and I guess that's where they both shine. I like the general sound of the RE20 and the fact that there is little to no proximity effect. The SM7B, on the other hand, has a more warm sound and, of course, it is more versatile. I have also seen the SM7B is used by artists I like, so if it wasn't for that, maybe I would go for the EV, but I'm afraid to miss out on the SM7B. Maybe she's the one? I don't have a very well-treated room. I make a lot of Beatles-esque rock music and I... to hell with it! Please give me some advice. Are those mics that different in the first place? Or do I start to lose my mind? Love the podcast. I always listen to it on my way to work. A lot of love, K. All right, Jeff, that is a difficult one. Let me say this. I'm not sure if the RE20 is used less for singing on records or in studios, but you certainly hear about it a lot less when people are mentioning microphones that they have in their studio mic lockers. I don't hear that as frequently as a voice microphone. However, I do know that Steve Albini, who is a recording engineer legend, used the EVPL20 on the In Utero recording by Nirvana, which to my understanding, the PL20 is the RE20. They just relabeled it to try to convince people that it was more of a studio microphone. It was the same thing to my understanding. Now, the RE20 will give you a crisper, more modern sound because it does extend a little bit higher. It doesn't have a little bit of a punchy midsection, but the SM7B will give you that warmer sound and that punchy midsection, which I just alluded to. I think that if you're going for a more Beatles-esque recording, you would probably want something warmer and more vintage sounding, which the SM7B would offer. But I honestly can't say which microphone will be better for you because it is your music, it is your recording, and it is you that has to like how it sounds. So I would recommend maybe going to B&H if there's one near you, or maybe go to a record shop near you. A record shop? No, a music shop near you. See if they have them. See if they have a studio. See if you could borrow them for 30 minutes and record into both. See which one you like best. But you have to make the decision for yourself I can't say buy this microphone and buy that microphone. And as far as the room noise, I don't think that's really going to be too big of an issue with music because that will be covered up a little bit and it can beefen up the voice a bit. So unless your room is really unpleasant in terms of reverb, then maybe the RE20 because it is a little bit more, a little bit tighter of a polar pattern and rejects a little bit more background noise. But the SM7B is more forgiving as you move off axis a little bit. That's my take on it. And the last comment comes from the Sick Boy Lounge. I'm interested in why you feel Voice Meter is a terrible program. I've only tried using it a few times and with a pre-made config file from another YouTuber, but I don't really understand the software itself or how to use it effectively. 
Some other live streamers that I know use it. To my untrained ears, they sound pretty great. So I'd love to hear your opinion on why you dislike the software. Thanks. Sick boy, that is a fair question. And to be honest, I'm sure it's a wonderful piece of software once you learn the intricacies of it. But when I tried to use it, it was one of the most unintuitive pieces of software that I have used. If somebody had not written out a how-to guide walking me through every step that I had to do, there's no way I would have figured it out in one day. It would have taken me multiple days to sort it out, finding the right YouTube tutorials. It just was not intuitive. And I personally, maybe it's just because I'm dumb, I like intuitive software. Maybe I'm just spoiled. Because on Mac, we have Rogue Amoebas, Loopback Audio, and Audio Hijack, which are just the simplest things that you could use and get the same effect as something like Loopback Audio. That's my take on it. I'm sure it's wonderful, though. I'm sure it's wonderful. Let's get to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. Oh! If you guys got any questions, no, welcome to the Ask Bandrew segment. That's what I do. If you have any questions, you can send them into askbandrew at gmail.com and I may answer them on an upcoming episode of the podcast. Don't forget, you can send in your audio questions, your video questions to that email, or you can use the SpeakPipe app, which is installed on bandrewscott.com or bandrewsays.com. First email comes from ENJ. He says, Hello, Bandrew. I just came here to email you after watching the BSP episode 176 in which you spoke about how Twitter will be restricting religious hate speech. How you spoke about religions made me wonder, are you atheist, agnostic, or do you follow your own beliefs? I 100% understand if you don't want to speak about your religious beliefs, so don't feel as if you need to answer this. Love your videos. Keep up the good work. Ian J, that is a great, great question, and I have no problem answering that. I grew up as a Christian, and now I suppose that technically I am an atheist, but I really don't fit within any of those labels because atheism has kind of become its own religion. People are so adamant about it and so outspoken about it. If I had to describe myself as anything, it would be apathetic. I just don't care. <laughs> I don't care in the slightest. Believe whatever you want. Just don't push those beliefs on me and don't hold beliefs that call for violence or harm to other people to come. That's really my entire stance. I couldn't care less. As long as you're not harming me, forcing your beliefs on me, or harming somebody else under the guise of, my God told me to do it. Leave other people alone. Who gives a crap what they do? It has zero effect on you. Zero impact on you. There you go. Second email comes from Ryan. He says, Hi, Bandrew. I was wondering why you use the Shure SM7B when in this Versus series, you said the Rode NT1 was your personal preference. Hope you're having a great day. Ryan was referring to my Versus series of the NT1 and the SM7B. I understand your confusion, Ryan, but let me explain something or bring something around from that video. In the conclusion portion of that Versus series between the NT1 and the SM7B, I state that when we get to the spoken word portion of the comparison, it becomes increasingly more difficult to select a winner, and I gave two options. First option, if you're in a well-treated, very quiet environment and you want some more detail to your vocal recordings, then absolutely go with the Rode NT1. But on the other hand, if you are in an environment with excessive background noise or you don't have a well-treated room, the SM7B did do a better job at background noise rejection. And on top of that, if you're not looking for the detail of the NT1 and you prefer darker, smoother tones, which is what I personally prefer, then absolutely go with the SM7B. And I'll end it by saying this, regardless of which of these two microphones you pick up, you're going to be in a very good situation because they're both absolutely amazing. They just have very different character. So although I selected the Rode NT1 as the overall winner, I explain it more in depth following that statement because there are varying circumstances under which the microphones perform different and better 
and it will rely on personal preference. And I stated in that review, in that comparison, that I prefer for spoken word, darker and smoother sounds, which is why I am using the SM7B. And that is why I always include the explanation for why I chose each of the microphones for the music, for the spoken word, for the singing, for all of that, because all microphones perform differently and somebody may have a differing point of view, a differing preference than me. And I like to explain it so they can know exactly why I did what I did or made a decision the way I did in those Versus series. Next email comes from Himanshu. He says, what is a good app slash software to test how your microphone sounds? I would like to hear myself to see how I sound using my new microphone, SM7B, because I am trying to decide between the RE27 and SM7B. Thank you. Himanshu, thank you very much for the email. It really depends on the operating system that you are using. If you want a free piece of software that is platform agnostic, meaning you can use it on Windows, Mac, or Linux, look into Audacity. That is the most widely used DAW, probably because it is free. It's pretty full featured. It's just ugly. It looks like it was designed in 1999, but it's free. It, it allows you to record and you can do all of that. If you're on a Mac, GarageBand is a very intuitive, a little bit limited on the features, but it's, it's free and it's intuitive, really easy to use. And then if you want a, to pay a little bit, or if you're willing to pay a little bit, and get a much more versatile and well-featured and well-updated recording software, DAW Digital Audio Workstation, look into Reaper. 60 bucks, super cheap. I don't know how frequently they update it because I don't use it, but 60 bucks, and it is also platform agnostic. Use it on Windows, Mac, Linux, anything and everything. Amazing piece of software there. Next email comes from Jack. He says, finally, I found a podcaster in America who discovered the Hong Kong anti-extradition protest. In a Hong Konger opinion, the protest originally is peaceful, and I agree with the people who protest. But after some time, protesters tried to destroy the government building and others. The protest is completely changed. Their goals are to break down whole Hong Kong with the protester, and that's it. I've been affected by the protest in my living district, and that makes lots of transport stop service and change the route. Therefore, the protest becomes unacceptable. Anyways, there are a few questions I would like to ask you. One, what are your thoughts on the Hong Kong protest after I point out the dark of it? Two, can you use this microphone setup? Three, what are your thoughts on cyberbullying? Four, have you been cyberbullied? Not cyberbullied, have you been bullied by others? Five, what are your thoughts on China-U.S. trade war? <laughs> Six, do you think that the U.S. blacklist of Huawei is reasonable? Jack, if anybody isn't on a Discord server, Jack is a Discord legend, <laughs> if this is the same kid. Jack called into the voice chat once while he was in the bathroom. <laughs> Another time, Jack called into the Discord voice chat while he was out at a restaurant at a table, every, everybody was clinking their plates, drinking and eating with his family. Jack is an absolute mad lad. <laughs> Jack, legend. Thoughts on the Hong Kong protest? If the motivation has changed that drastically from actually fighting against extradition to mainland China and now it is just anarchy, I don't support that in the slightest. I don't like protesters who are just want to watch the world burn. I think that is ridiculous. If you are not fighting for a good purpose, stop it. You're just being a dick at that point. <laughs> That's my take on it. Although if they are actually doing this to fight the extradition to mainland China, they are just going about it in some crazy way. I still somewhat support it, although I wish they could accomplish it in a more peaceful manner. The second question was, can I use the... CAD E100S through the DBX286S into the URRT2 Rupert Neve Steinberg interface? No. No. Not trying to be a dick. <laughs> but I am just having so much fun on the SM7B again, playing with the settings and trying to tune it exactly how I like it. So, no. Sorry. Third, my thoughts on cyberbullying. Get ready for a hot take. Cyberbullying sucks. It is awful because it seems inescapable for kids. What I mean is when you are young, 
your entire life or the most important aspect of your life seems to be your social life. And nowadays, social life is handled all on the internet. So yes, you can put your phone down to escape the cyberbullying, but what do you do when you do that? You can't go hang out with friends. You can't go skateboard with friends. You can't go hiking with friends because the youths, the gee dang youths, all they do is want to play fork knife online with their friends. So if you want to socialize, you have to be online. But if you're being cyber bullied, you can't avoid that. You can't go hide out in a, a cafe. You can't go hide out in a clubhouse anymore because kids just want to play fork knife. So it sucks. Have I been bullied? Yes, it absolutely sucked because they were mean enough to do it to my face. But you know what? I'm kind of glad that it happened because being bullied, it helped me in a, in a very weird way. It helped me become more empathetic towards other people because I realized, oh, this sucks. I don't like the way that this makes me feel. So why would I ever try to make somebody else feel that way? I would never do that because I understand how awful it is. It is a huge, it sucks. I'll say that. But it has also helped me develop a thicker skin so I can handle a lot more criticism and mean things being said to me. And if I didn't develop that thicker skin, I don't think I would have survived on YouTube so far. I don't think I'd be uploading to YouTube because I would have just curled up into a ball and cried myself to sleep and just said, I'm never uploading to the internet again. They're so mean. But I got bullied. I got stuff thrown at me. I think I've shared this story before, but my school had a big courtyard and there were two floors. You could look out onto the courtyard from the second floor. I was walking on the first floor. Somebody took an unopened soda can and threw it as hard as they could at the back of my head and just knocked me down. I have been bullied and abused and beaten. <laughs> but that's how I'm able to do YouTube. You can say as much mean stuff about me as you want. <laughs> you can't hate me half as much as I hate myself. That's my real key. <laughs> don't, don't take that advice and don't listen to me. Thoughts on the China-US trade war. I'm not an economist and I have not dug too deep into the trade war. But I do think that some of the rhetoric is a little bit off base or misguided. I have heard people saying, well, China is going to be giving us so much more money because we're putting these tariffs in there. I don't think it's China that's paying the tariffs. When something is imported to the U.S. from China, a tax gets added on top of that. The company says, oh, well, this just became more expensive. The company doesn't say, well, OK, I guess we're not making as much money. The company says, well, we'll go ahead and incorporate this new cost into the price that we pass on to the consumer. So who is actually paying that tax? It's not China. It's not the company. It's the consumer in higher prices. Now, currently, it doesn't seem like price increases or these tariffs are affecting essential items. It is more luxury items or items that you would spend disposable income on. It's not food right now, it doesn't seem. It seems more electronics. So what would that lead to? People wouldn't be able to buy the latest iPhone. I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. We could do with buying less iPhones and less new phones and new computers because we don't need the latest and most up-to-date. We're just creating a bunch of waste when we upgrade every single year, he says, knowing that he buys 50 plus microphones every single year. Don't act like you've never seen a hypocrite before. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. I see your judging eyes and your judging ears. Get off my case. You've, you've seen hypocrites before. So it's not China that's paying the tariff. It's the U.S. consumer and the Chinese consumer. We're getting screwed. That's it. And six, is the ban of Huawei justified? I don't know. I don't have enough information. Jack, thank you very much for the email. I appreciate you. Very good questions. And yeah, I hope you are the Jack from the Discord server because that kid was a mad lad legend. Next, we got a voice submission from Chaz. Take it away, Chaz. Hello, Bantru. My name is Chaz Ravenel. I am an avid listener of the BSP, and I have a couple of questions for you today. 
The first question is, can you tell us about your routine and or standard procedure, if any, when preparing for an episode of the BSP? For instance, recording at a specific time of day, preparing topics, gathering notes, setting up equipment, etc. Also, was there ever a time when things went horribly wrong? Question number two is, are you a pan or deep dish pizza kind of guy? And that's it. Thank you so much, Bandrew. I very much enjoy the show. I look forward to the next episode and appreciate you. Did I just steal your tagline? My bad. Chaz, how dare you insult me that way? But my God, you sound good in that recording. I appreciate you. He said it. I can't believe he said it. Yes. Okay, Chaz. <laughs> I, I'm slowly losing my mind. I hope you're all aware of that. And I hope that this is studied in science classes 100 years from now. Watching the descent, the publicly broadcast descent from sanity to complete and utter insanity and madness. First question, my routine, standard operating procedure, and time when things went horribly wrong. As far as the notes and outline and generation of all of that, for a while, I was really good. I was going into the news every evening for 30 minutes, going over the news stories, picking out the ones I wanted to discuss and analyze, and then generating the, the outline and my thoughts around that topic that same night. Then when Saturday rolls around or Sunday rolls around, I just sit down, record. It was beautiful. But I've reverted to bad behavior, back to bad habits, where I will not start looking at the news until Saturday and Sunday, and then I work on those that right before I start recording and then go to record. So it's terrible. As far as warm-up, I do lip trills to try to warm up my voice that's and so on and so forth. I try to do some breathing exercises, but I'm really bad at that. I need to get better at supporting my voice with my diaphragm. I need to get better at that. I was in choir. I should know how to do that. Recording time, that changes. It changes. I try to start at around 11 to 12 and then record for an hour, hour and a half, which is pretty standard right now. It is one o'clock and I started around 11.50. So yeah, about an hour, hour and a half of recording. Editing, that'll take a lot longer. The processing, all of that, maybe one o'clock to four o'clock, so three hours there. And that's when I'm also doing the timestamps. And then an hour doing thumbnail show notes and uploading and creating the MP3, all of that stuff. So maybe a eight hour process to do the show total with notes, outline generation, news analysis, recording, warm up, editing, uploading, show notes, timestamps, all of that. I hope that gave you some insight into it. And I will be doing a, a video on how I edit and do all of that stuff, if I can get OBS to work out. Then as far as when something went horribly, horribly wrong, the BSP episode 140, horribly awry. I was out of town. I was recording in a hotel room. I got done and it went well enough. Went well enough, perfectly fine. Then I open up RX-7 to process my audio, which I have never done. I always use the plug-in version of RX-7. I never edit in RX-7, but this time I decided to do that. Opened up RX-7, did the noise removal, the de-reverb, everything. And I got a little bit too aggressive with it, to say the least. And then I overwrote the original WAV file. So all I had was this, this audio that had been processed to absolute, absolute hell. It was un usable, unlistenable. I hated it. And I was not willing to release that. So I had to go ahead and re-record the entire thing. And then I learned my lesson. Don't just try something random and new when you are in a place where you have never recorded before. How about you just stick to what you normally do, you big dope? That's when something went horribly wrong. I had to re-record an entire episode because I was stupid and overwrote the original file after overly processing something. And then two pan or deep dish pizza kind of guy. I would say that I am more of a pan pizza. Ah, oh, but deep dish is so good. Ah, oh, they're, they're both so good. 
If I could be a bit more of a blasphemer, though, I'm more of a thin crust kind of guy. I know. Ugh. Thin crust kind of guy, but it's not because I think it tastes better. Not because I think it is better. It's because after I eat too much thin crust pizza, I hate myself a tiny bit less than when I eat too much pan pizza or deep dish. Thin crust gives me a little bit more leeway, a little bit more forgiveness for eating too many slices because it's thin. It's thin. It's not as bad for you, right? <laughs> it's all bad for you, but thin crust, if I had to pick between those two, I suppose it would depend on the city I'm in. If I am in Chicago, deep dish all the way. If I am in New York, kind of a thin pan. Let's go with that. Chaz, thank you very much for sending in the audio question and the audio submission. You sound really good. I appreciate you. I did it again. You see what I did? Now you just made me self-conscious about saying that. I don't care. I'm going to continue to do it. That is it for the Ask Bander segment, the what you had to say, the news analysis, personal thing. The audio critique that I have been promoting is not going to be on this podcast. I have decided. It has been decided. The audio stuff is going to be a standalone podcast, a new podcast that I will be launching in the next month or so. It's going to be audio critiques, educational stuff, how to's, all of the above, and it is going to be so much fun. So I have a bunch of audio critique submissions. I have my criteria on how I am going to actually critique and analyze it. I have an eight point system. I am going to give you corrective actions on what I think you should do to improve it. Oh man, it's going to be so much fun, but I'm not going to start with the audio critique. I am going to start a little bit more top level, and then around episode 10, I am going to start the critique, but I am going to start by critiquing and ripping apart my own show to show you how it will work, and then I'll give you the option to pull out your podcast if you don't want me to do that because you thought it was just going to be a little bit lighter, but I am going to dive, to dive deep and rip this stuff apart. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. I know it was more listener-based questions, but there was nothing interesting, and I had to scream for about 15 minutes because Equifax are a bunch of scumbags, and I needed something light after that. So your submissions, your feedback, you are all amazing. I appreciate you. I'll talk to you next week. <laughs> Bye, guys. This has been a Geeks Rising production, your executive producer of Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.